Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see each and every one of you. It's a big day today. I'm glad the Cardinal game is at four. I was afraid nobody would show up if it was any earlier. So big game. We're rooting for the Cardinals, right? Right? Green Bay fans, we're rooting for the Cardinals, right? I was going to wear, I actually have Carolina colors on. I was going to wear a red shirt, but then, you know, you have to iron it and do all that stuff. So I just, it's so much work. But uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we are all encouraged later on today. Well, today we continue in our series in which we have entitled Hope. And as I stated last week, um, I really do believe that we as Christians are to be the most hope-filled people on this planet. And again, it's not a pie-in-the-sky type of hope where we bury our head, heads in the sand, where we ignore our problems, where we just, just assume that things are going to get better. It is a different type of hope. It is a radical type of hope that is grounded in the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has died for our sins and has made it possible that we can walk into the throne room of God whenever we want and come to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the sovereign God of the universe, and present our concerns and our worries and our burdens to him. Right? This isn't clicking here. That is why the scriptures say in Hebrews 4, 16, let us then with confidence, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, we as Christians have something the world just doesn't have. We have a relationship with the one true living God of the universe. And folks, that is the basis of our hope. And it is grounded in the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he rose again. And we know without a doubt that our sins are forgiven. Amen? Which of the world religions can say that your sins are can be totally forgiven and that you can know it and you can walk in it knowing that God accepts you. It is Christianity, Christianity alone because we have the answer for sin's problem, a crucified and risen Messiah. And as we start this series and as we get into this series, that's the basis of hope. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, that's where it starts. That is where it starts. By coming to Christ and going, I am a sinner, I trust in you. And when you do that, the Bible says your sins are forgiven and you now are accepted by God. And you can come to God whenever you want, knowing that you're forgiven and accepted, you've been adopted, you're a child of God, and you can come before the throne of grace with confidence to have your heart encouraged because you can bring your prayers, your requests, your burdens, your worries, whatever it might be, to the throne of God itself. Amen? I didn't even plan on doing it. I saw, watched that video again, and I got all excited. <laughs> got to preach the gospel. And I'm going to preach an extra 10 minutes because of Greg's little comment there, too, by the way. <laughs> so you let Greg have it later on. But here's the deal. I said it last week. That doesn't mean that as Christians, we'll always be walking in abundant hope because hope can be elusive sometimes, even for Christians. There will be days when our ability to have hope will be put to the test. It will be put to the test. And with this many people in this room right now, there are some of you, you've been put to the test recently. And it's hard. Your hope has maybe been a bit elusive for you. But here's the deal. One of the key times that our ability to have hope will really be put to the test is when God makes us wait. And folks, if you know anything about the God of the Bible, God often makes his children wait, doesn't he? He sure does. He sure does. And I'm not talk, just talking days. God often makes his children wait for months, years, decades. And in some circumstances, even in the Bible, we see centuries. We see this pattern all throughout the Bible. Did you know that when King David was anointed king of Israel, he had to wait another 15 years before he actually took the throne? Imagine God says, I got something great for you, but you got to wait. Did you know? That God had promised the nation of Israel a Messiah. But they had to wait century after century after century for that Messiah to come. Everyone in here who is a true Christian can give personal testimony to the fact that God often makes his children wait, doesn't he? 
doesn't he? If you're a Christian, and if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know God often makes his children wait. Waiting, of course, is one of those things that people in general aren't very good at. I don't care who you are or what generation you're living in, waiting is hard, is it not? And as Greg said earlier, aptly said, I don't say that often, but he said it, and he said it well, we live in, I'm just teasing, I'm, I, I'm going to get him back for that little comment that he said. We live in a generation, um, we live in a now generation. I was driving down the 101 freeway, I kid you not, it was, it's, it was down a couple of miles headed towards Scottsdale, and I don't know if you guys saw it, but there's a, a billboard ad, and it says, it's for Amazon Prime, and you can literally order something off Amazon Prime and have it at your front door in one hour. That's crazy. That's crazy. Think about it. You can go on the internet and look for anything and everything that exists in the world. And you can order it and have it at your front door in one hour. We live in a different generation. It's not like 100 years ago when you planted a crop and you waited and you waited and you waited. We live in the now generation But here's the deal. Waiting upon the Lord is very unique. It's one thing to wait. Listen to this. It's another thing to wait upon the Lord. David says in Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Look at what it says. And let your heart Take courage. Let there be hope in your heart. Take courage as you wait. He says it again, for the Lord. He doesn't just say, wait, be strong. Take courage. Wait. He says, wait for the Lord. Listen, everyone has to wait. But a non-Christian does not wait in the same manner as a believer. Because when a believer waits, he or she is waiting upon the Lord. And when you wait upon the Lord, you are in totally different waters than the non-believer. Because when you are waiting upon the Lord, you are no longer calling the shots. When you wait upon the Lord, you have surrendered all your rights to govern your life. And you have put all of your hope in the Lord. You have sacrificed your schedule and put yourself on his So when you wait upon the Lord, God gets to decide what to provide for you, when to provide it for you, how to provide it for you. You become totally dependent upon one person and one person alone, the Lord. You become submissive to his schedule and his timing. See, when I'm not waiting upon the Lord, I can wait. I don't have to wait upon the Lord. I I may have to wait, but I don't have to wait upon the Lord. If I'm not waiting upon the Lord, I can at least take matters into my own hands and try to get what I want. When I am not waiting upon the Lord, I can push my agenda on my timetable, right? As Christians, however, we resist the temptation. We resist the temptation to take matters into our own hands. Instead, we die to self, and we put all of our hope in the Lord. Waiting upon the Lord to provide in his way and in his time But let's be honest, dying to self isn't easy, is it? Dying to self isn't easy. As a matter of fact, as if you can die to self, it has to be Christ in you, putting to death the old man. It is so much easier to trust in myself than to trust in the Lord. It is so much easier to do things on my timetable than to wait upon the Lord. And it is Sad how much self-confidence Pastor Bill has in himself. And as a people in general, as a, the human race has so much confidence in itself. And perhaps you do too. I know from a childhood I have been taught, Bill, trust in yourself, believe in yourself, rely upon yourself, be your own man, Bill. But what do the scriptures say? The scriptures say just the opposite. Oops. It says just the opposite. Whatever you do, don't trust in yourself. You know this verse. It's a famous verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The last thing you want to do is trust yourself. The last thing you want to do as a Christian is rely upon what you think is right. And to think that 
You know when you need things and what you need and how you need it. And you're going to get them on. The last thing you want to do is that. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And that means with timing, the timing. I will wait for the Lord. I will trust his timing for my life. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. That's what the scripture says. Have no confidence in yourself. Put all your stock in the Lord. None, none in yourself. If there is even a shred of self-trust in you, beseech the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, to put it to death in you. And by the way, that's the only way it'll happen, is you say, God, I have a tendency to trust myself, and that needs to die. But it can only die if you work in me and through me and help me to do that. Because, folks, it only takes a shred, a shred of self-trust before you start to take matters into your own hands and before I start to take matters into my own hands, right? It only takes a sliver. Doesn't take much at all. And you know what happens when I don't wait upon the Lord and I take matters into my own hands? Nothing good. It's the truth. Nothing good. And you would attest to that too. Nothing good. The only thing that I can count on happening when I take matters into my own hands, and this is true. This isn't meant to be funny, but it is funny, is I become an ogre to everybody around me, right? I I drive my wife crazy. I drive my kids crazy. I drive my friends crazy because I want things done my way, on my schedule, right? It's got to be my way. And if I don't, I don't want to wait for anything or anyone. And, and, and here's the deal. If I am forced to wait, you're going to get nothing but a bad attitude from me. Do I hear an amen? You're like, I'm sitting next to that person. I know who you're describing. I'm describing me. I do. When I take matters into my own hands, even with just a shred of self-trust in me, I take matters into my own hands, I become a jerk. I really do, and, I, and maybe that's a strong word and that's going to offend some of you, but I do to my wife and my kids because I become an ogre. I demand things on my schedule, and if I don't get things on my schedule, I get upset with the people that aren't giving me things on my schedule. You're in the way. You're holding this up, right? But everything changes Everything changes when that part of me dies and I completely trust in the Lord. I turn my heart over to the Lord and I say, Lord, I trust your timing for my life. As hard as it is, Lord, because you are in a totally different schedule than anyone else, including myself, but I trust in you. When I do that, I suddenly find myself content, more patient, more kind, less stress, less demanding. Because now God is calling the shots, and I don't have to stress about things because he's got it in control. Amen? That's the great thing. That's the great thing when we, as Christians, wait upon the Lord, and we trust in him. Our families are transformed. Our workplaces are transformed. Our neighborhoods are transformed. Our relationships are transformed. Why? Because we're no longer demanding. We're no longer self-centered. We're no longer doing the things that the old man used to do. Rather, we're trusting in the one who lives and reigns from heaven above, and we trust his timing for our lives. You want to know one of the big reasons, by the way, that God makes us wait? And many of you in here are probably, God has you in a holding pattern right now. You've been waiting. He's got you in a holding pattern in some way, and you're going, gosh, I needed to hear this. One of the big reasons that God makes us wait is because it gives us time to sort out our motives. Let's be honest. Sometimes our motives aren't all that pure, are they? By the way, we're horrible judges of ourselves, and I do mean this. I, have you ever done something and you're like, why did I do that? And you're not even sure what your motivation was in it? Yeah, you, there, there's times, a lot of times I do things, I'm like, was that... You know, was that pure motives or was I looking for glory or was I looking for this or was I trying to do that? I don't always know what my motives are. We like to think that our motives are pure, but again, we're not good judges of ourselves. And we just also, we do things and we're like, I I totally don't know what my motive was in that. James says this, you do not have because you do not ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, James says that a lot of times we are asking God for things in prayer. We're doing it with selfishness in our hearts. 
Folks, listen, I might pray the most eloquent and beautiful prayer you have ever heard. And I'm just doing that to impress you. (laughs) I'm not. I might pray the most beautiful and eloquent prayer you've ever heard and I've ever heard, but it might come from actual impure motives in my heart. James says that's the case. And so God uses time. Listen, God uses time to reveal our motives. As God makes us wait, he graciously and slowly, listen to this, he graciously and slowly reveals our true motives to us. You can be thankful that God doesn't reveal the total extent of the depravity of your heart right away because it would crush you and me. But God is gracious and he's patient with us and he's slow with us. Like a good parent, he reveals to us our motives over time. It's called the process of sanctification. He's sanctifying us. He's making us more holy. And that is why, folks, if God has you in a holding pattern right now in your life, if you are waiting in an area of your life, you're in a holding pattern, it is wise to stop and ask this question, God, reveal to me my motives. God, show me if there's anything in me that's not pure. What did David say? He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me. Or other translations, the NIV translated, any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Listen, one of the greatest gifts God can give to you is insight into what is truly motivating you. One of the greatest gifts you can ask for God, from God is for him to give you insight into what's truly motivating you deep down in your heart. That's a gift from God. And you want that. Why? Because if you need to be rebuked, what do the scriptures say? A wise man receives a rebuke. A wise man loves to be disciplined and chastened by the Lord because he will grow wiser. She will grow wiser. And so when you pray, you pray. If God's got you in a holding pattern, you say, Lord, use this time to refine me and reveal anything in me, God, that is offensive to you or is grievous to you. Because one of the greatest gifts I know that you can give to me, God, the greatest gift you can give to me is a heart that's more in love with you and more pure in every way. Of course, the dangers of not waiting upon the Lord, folks, are enormous. I want to point out two today. These are just two general ones. Um, The first is this. It's divorce. It is divorce. Young adults, and I think one of the reasons the divorce rate is so high here in America is young adults are rushing into marriage. They're rushing into marriage. And that includes young adults who are Christian. Folks, if ever there were an area we want to tell young Christian adults to wait upon the Lord, it is in this area when waiting for a spouse. But the reality is, it is just the opposite. There is an immense pressure put upon young Christian adults, even within the context of churches, to find a spouse. And I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. I do it all the time. I see young Christians, and I go, yeah, did you find the right person yet? You know, can I play matchmaker? I have got somebody I can introduce you to. Very rarely do I say, wait. Be patient and wait. God will provide for you. And I'm a testimony to this. I really am. Um, I became a Christian at age 16. I got saved at 16. I I grew up in the church. I wasn't a Christian. And God gave me a new heart at age 16. And by God's grace, one of the first things I started doing was praying for my wife. I didn't know who she was. I just knew she was out there. And I would pray for her. And there were many nights um, in college and just in my dorm room where I was alone. And I wanted to rush to find somebody. I really wanted her to be in my life. And there were plenty of women and girls, awesome Christian women that I knew in inner varsity that I could have rushed the process, but I knew in my heart they're not the one. And so God made me wait and wait. But in that process, I prayed and I told God exactly what I wanted. I told him the desires of my heart. And at the right time, he brought the right woman into my life. To make matters worse for the young Christian adults out there, there are now thousands of dating and relationship websites that are fueling the pressure to find someone and find them quickly, right? You can order something off Amazon Prime and have it in an hour. You can also click a button and have a wife in about an hour. (laughs) That's the generation that we now live in. What a relief, folks, for the younger generation of Christians if we 
as mature Christian adults, give them one piece of advice when it comes to a spouse. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon him. Trust him and his timing. Don't rush the process. Don't settle. Wait for the Lord. Pray to him and tell him your heart's desires, and he will bring you the right person at the right time. Believe it. Believe it. The second tragic consequence of impatience, I think, is debt. Debt is often the result of impatience. Millions upon millions of Christians are in debt simply because they have not waited for God to provide. Does that mean all debt is bad? No. Christians can leverage debt. That's a whole other sermon. There's nothing wrong with Christians being wise and leveraging debt to their advantage. But a lot of debt is just simply bad. It's consumer debt. It's because we want things now, and I have to get it now. And if I can't have it now, I'll pay for it later, and I'll get credit, and, some, and I can get it now. And I think a lot of times we as Christians, we have debt simply because one of two reasons. Number one is we either haven't asked God. That's what James says. You have not because you ask not. Or we have asked God for it, but we grew impatient and didn't wait for him to provide it. And by the way, just in case you're tempted to think that not waiting upon the Lord isn't that big of a deal, for in the Christian circles, being impatient is one of those acceptable sins, right? You can be an impatient person. You can be a Christian with a fish on the back of your car and be the most impatient person in the world, and we'll look the other way because it's just impatience, right? It's not like you're committing adultery or that you've committed murder. You're just a little bit impatient. But is impatience a big deal to God? Is getting out in front of God and ahead of God a big deal to him? Yes, So much so that you will remember just one example. It was King Saul, the first king of Israel. He was told to wait seven days for Samuel, the prophet, to come. And in that seven-day period, he didn't come. And so Saul grew afraid, and in his fear, because his men began to scatter, he grew impatient. And he went and he sacrificed an, an animal. He was the king, but he was not a priest. He was not to do that. In in his impatience, he got out in front of God. And what did God do? He stripped him of the kingdom because of that. Samuel shows up and says, because of this, the kingdom will be taken from you. And it was then that it was given to David, but then even David had to wait another 15 years. There was going to be a transition period. It is a big deal when we get out ahead of God. When we say, God, I don't trust you enough to wait for you and to wait for your timing, for my life. Often as Americans, we wear our impatience like a badge of honor, right? We don't wait for anyone. We're proud of it. How many many of you have have somebody in your life when you go to church, they're out in the car honking because you're not, anybody have anybody like that? It's like, hurry up and get out here. We got to get to church. Now, granted, sometimes the person in the car is the one who's on time and they're trying to encourage somebody who's not. Oh, I understand that. But. but here's the deal, folks. In the kingdom of God, the badge of honor is worn by the one who waits patiently upon the Lord, placing all of their hope in him and, the, and his ability to provide. So let me give you some biblical reasons why you can have genuine hope when you wait upon the Lord. I've been a Christian 30 years. I got saved 1987. I was 16. I'm now 45, so it's right around 30 years. I've I know a thing or two about waiting. Okay, I know a thing or two about waiting. The first thing I want to just encourage you with is this. First, I have the hope that my heart's desires are known by God Himself. When God has you in a holding pattern and He has you waiting, no one understand this. He knows what is on your heart. He knows your heart's desires. Your heart's desires aren't being held up in a bureaucracy somewhere. God, the Judge of all the earth, the one who has the ability to do anything, knows your heart's desire. And listen to this. He knows them personally. There isn't some middle man that you have to go through. Have you ever gone to somebody like a superior at work and told them something and they said they'll take it higher up, but you wonder if they ever took it higher up, if they ever took it to their bosses? You don't have to worry about that with God because you yourself, because of the shed blood of Christ, can walk into the throne room of God and tell him exactly what your heart desires. And by the way, I encourage you, when was it, in in all honesty, when was the last time you told the Lord your heart's desire? 
you have not because you ask not. I think so often I forget to tell God, Lord, I kind of want this. My heart's desire is for this. I forget to tell him. I even forget to ask. You never have to wonder if God knows what is going on in your heart. Incidentally, God knows your heart's desires better than you know your heart's desires. Psalm 37, verse 4. This was the first verse I learned after becoming a Christian. I had learned verses growing up in the church, but this was the first one I'd learned, memorized after becoming a Christian. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Folks, you and I have one job. Delight ourselves in the Lord. Put our hope in him. Die to self. Any last shred of self-trust, any idols, anything that we cling to, we cast it aside, and we put all of our hope in God, and we delight in him. And the Bible says, he will then give you the desires of your heart. You have your job, I have my job, and God has his. Secondly, I have the hope that God's timing is always perfect. There is a saying, timing is everything, right? Well, guess who wrote the book on timing? God. God won't ever make you or I wait For the sake of waiting. When God makes us wait, he's timing things out for you on his schedule. And that is what you want. Why did God make Israel seemingly wait so long for the Messiah? I'll tell you why. It all had to do with timing. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoptions of sons. Why did Christ come when he came? Because it was all about God's timing. It was the perfect timing. Folks, have hope in God's timing for your life. Have faith that God knows what he's doing with your life. And so when he puts you into a holding pattern, be content Because the God of the universe knows your heart's desires and he will not ever withhold something from you one second longer than it should, than he should. He'll give it to you the moment the time is right. Remind yourself that God's time is better than your time all the time. You can post that on Facebook too, by the way, if you want. That was a good one. God's time is better than your time all the time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge his timing for your life in every facet of your life. God's time is better than your time all the time. And I have to believe it. And that gives me the patience and the joy to walk with God and this stuff is going on around me, and the world is going on around me, I don't have to worry about anything because I'm on God's schedule, and I'm trusting in his timing. Thirdly, I have the hope that God is doing what is best for me. As a child, I have to believe that God knows what's best for me. Therefore, I'm just as hopeful as when God provides as to when he doesn't. Either way, I have the hope that God is acting in my best interest. If you have been waiting for God to give you something and he's not giving it to you, guess what? That's in your best interest. Believe it. God is not punishing you. He is working all things for your good and his glory. I don't ever have to wonder, by the way, when I wait upon the Lord, if I've missed out on something in life, because if I have waited for the Lord and he doesn't provide it for me, I haven't missed out on anything because God is always acting in my best interest. And sometimes the best thing for you and for me is God puts us in a holding pattern. He makes us wait and he doesn't give us what we want. Amen. It's a little bit different than the prosperity gospel that you hear often on TV. Yeah. The the true gospel, folks, is about dying to self, putting yourself on God's schedule, submitting yourself to him in every way, letting him use you in this world to be a light for him, no matter what the cost to you. And folks, I'll tell you this right now. When you wait upon the Lord, there are no regrets. There are never any regrets when you wait upon the Lord. Let me say it again. There are no regrets when you wait upon the Lord because when I wait upon the Lord, he is going to do what is in my best interest at his time for my life. 
And I don't ever have to wonder, gosh, did I blow that? Did I miss that? Did I make a mistake? No. I've waited for the Lord. And I've prayed to him and I've beseeched him and I, I fasted before him and I've trusted in him. And he knows my heart's desire. I delighted in him with all of my heart. I've sacrificed anything, any last shed of self-trust or any idols that I might trust in. And, I've, and I wait for him. And there's no regrets when you wait for the Lord. Lastly, I have the hope that God can do far more than I hope, ask, or imagine when I wait upon him. What do the scriptures say? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within him, within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Folks, when you trust in God and wait for him to provide for you, you now have placed your hope in an all-powerful God with unlimited resources, knowledge, and understanding. Your hope literally knows no bounds when you trust in God. And I oftentimes I'll bring a heart's desire to God. I'm like, Lord, would you maybe, you know, this is what I desire. Would you consider giving that to me? I rarely come to God and say, God, here's my heart's desire with the belief that this could explode because my God is huge and he can do far more than I ask, think, or imagine. I bring him my heart's desires and I say, Lord, this is my heart's desire. And I have hope that he can do far greater than even what I bring to him. My hope literally knows no bounds when I'm waiting upon the Lord because there is nothing that God does not know. There is nothing he cannot do. There is no obstacle he cannot remove. And there is nothing that he cannot provide. By the way, once you trust in yourself, once you say, God, I don't know that I trust in your timing. I'm not going to wait for you. I'm going to do things in my own schedule and in my own way. Here's the problem you have. Your hope is now limited to what you yourself can provide for yourself in your timing and with your resources. If you want to hope, have hope that's limited to yourself, go for it. I don't. The older I get, the more I realize how frail I really am. How little I actually know. How few resources and how little strength I actually have in myself. I don't want to be on my schedule, providing for myself on, in my time, in my way. If that's the case, then the, my hope is, my hope's out the window. But when I trust in him, my hope is unlimited. It is unlimited because there is nothing that he cannot do. I said earlier in this message that waiting upon the Lord is one of the hardest things you will ever do. Folks, listen to me very carefully. I'm going to close with this. When you wait upon the Lord, you have something the rest, you have something, we have something the rest of the world doesn't have. And here's what you have. You have the confidence that your waiting is not in vain. It is never in vain when you wait for the Lord. Amen? We're going to have prayer warriors up here. An awesome prayer team here after the service, right after the service. Some of you have been in a holding pattern in your life. God has had you waiting for something. Let us pray with you about that. Let us come and lift it to the Lord. Come and tell us your heart's desires and we'll pray. We'll, we'll lift it up to the Lord together. Don't let another Sunday pass before coming to the Lord in prayer. Just pouring out to him what you need to pour out to him. Let me close in prayer. Well, gracious Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, we thank you that your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. God, may we be reminded of that the next time we are tempted to be impatient and do things on our schedule and our way. God, make us a people who wait upon the Lord. When the world looks at us, may they see something different. And that something different, God, may it be a patience a people of patience who wait upon the Lord and trust in him. And God, I know that there's many in here right now that have been in a holding pattern. You've had them in a holding pattern. You've had me in a holding pattern, Scott, in my life. I pray for strength today, a renewal of hope and trust in you. So, Father, we love you so very much. We commit the rest of this day to you. In Christ's name, amen.